Welcome to Let the Qur'an Speak. Muslims turn to the Qur'an, the teachings of Prophet Muhammad, and the explanations of Muslim scholars for guidance on how to live their lives. But how can we faithfully understand and interpret the legacy of Prophet Muhammad in our modern world? This is the subject of Jonathan Brown's latest book, Misquoting Muhammad. Jonathan Brown is an Associate Professor of Islamic Studies and Muslim Christian Understanding in Georgetown University's School of Foreign Service. Joining me to review Brown's book is Dr. Shabir Ali. Dr. Shabir, what are your impression of Jonathan Brown's latest book? Um, uh, several points. Uh, I, I, I can talk about the things I like about it, the things that um, I don't uh, exactly like about it. Um, but uh, let's talk about the things we like. Huh? Uh, first of all, uh, it's a very impressive book, massive size, uh, and it's very readable. Um, it, one gets the impression that the author I is well read. Uh, he, he's definitely a scholar. Uh, he uh, knows the Islamic world. I mean, he has studied in various parts of the Islamic world, Yemen, Egypt, uh, India, and so on, um, well, among Muslims in India. Uh, and um, uh, he is very well schooled in Islamic history. He is an expert on the subject of uh, the hadith or traditions uh, uh, which report the uh, sayings and actions uh, of the Prophet Muhammad on whom be peace. And what is the, the core message of this book? Mm, well, uh, I don't know if there's one particular message, uh, but, but if I were to try to derive that message, it is that uh, it, it is not very easy in modern times to apply the legacy of the Prophet Muhammad, both in terms of the Quranic verses and uh, uh, other than the Quran, uh, traditions which have been a, a, a attributed to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So you have uh, sayings which were put into uh, texts um, some 1400 years ago, and now modern life is very different. How do Muslims negotiate uh, between the two, allegiance to the tradition and at the same time uh, the level of comfort that is required uh, within our modern landscape. Is that a new problem or is that something that has been in, an, a challenge throughout history? It's been a challenge throughout history and what Brown has done in the most excellent manner possible is that he has uh, navigated this whole historical landscape to see how Muslims have uh, negotiated with changes over time. What have they done when, when they start with a verse of the Quran and they see that it doesn't really quite fit the new and changing circumstances? What have they done with the Hadith when they see that it doesn't fit the uh, new situations? And he has shown that uh, there's always been a variety of approaches. Some Muslims taking the Hadith literally and insisting it must be so, you follow it no matter what. Uh, but uh, mostly there have been um, some adjustments made uh, by, by, by many great scholars in the past. They look at the verse and they say, well, it can't be applied exactly like that, but they do it this other way. Are there some examples that he gives of that? Uh, yes, for example, the uh, uh, women, uh, according to a, a hadith, cannot be married uh, um, without their, their guardian's consent. Uh, but he showed that Imam Abu Hanifa, uh, one of the great uh, scholars and the founder of, uh, well, the eponym of one of the great four schools of Islamic jurisprudence, uh, holds that in fact if a woman is mature, uh, she can marry without her guardian's permission, and in fact that she has more right uh, than her guardian to decide how to uh, deal with her own person. So it seems that despite there being sacred text, there's also some malleability that the scholars used in how they interpreted them. Yes, uh, they look at the text, they also look at the situation, they look at the reasonableness of uh, what they're going to apply so that in the end they arrive at something that uh, looks good from, from all perspectives. Now we're about 1400 years removed from the Prophet Muhammad, so it, it might seem obvious that some things nowadays are different from how they were back then. Uh, what are some of the challenges that, that Brown uh, talks about in, in bringing that tradition to life today? Uh, one of the uh, problems is with uh, m verses which people interpret as uh, being violent verses of the Quran, and so too with uh, passages in, in Hadith literature. Uh, two is the question of whether women can be leaders, uh, leaders of state, and uh, more specifically the leader of a prayer, uh, in which there is a mixed gathering of both men and women. Um, and there is the verse of the Quran that is interpreted to mean that a man could beat his wife. Th these are some of the striking examples that stand out. 
And how does Brown explain those those examples? As for the uh, women, woman being a head of state, uh, he does not seem to have any difficulty with that. Um, he, uh, by by uh, combining the statements of scholars and their various approaches, um, Brown seems to be showing that uh, the, the hadith which said that uh, a, a community will not prosper if they make uh, the head of state a woman. Uh, that, that hadith seems to have been explained by scholars uh, to have something to do with the situation at the time when it was said. So it does not seem to be a universal rule. As for women uh, leading uh, prayers of mixed gatherings, he has shown that in fact there have been scholars over time, such as Ibn Arabi, uh, who, who said that, in, uh, that, that there is no real prohibition and uh, there is a precedent um, shown in the example of uh, Um Waraka, who, a, a woman who actually led her household in prayer and the household uh, would actually normally include men as well. So there does not seem to be any difficulty there. And as for the practical uh, situation of how you're going to situate the men and women in prayer, uh, he shows that, uh, in fact, uh, a, a many schools of Islamic jurisprudence hold that uh, if you're praying behind a leader and you're separated from the leader by, let's say, a wall, uh, then your prayer is still valid. So uh, to Brown, it seems possible that a woman could actually lead a, a mixed congregation in, in prayer and the issue of haya or modesty or uh, the, the problem of uh, being distracted in the prayer, uh, this does not arise because there, there are possible ways of dealing with these uh, minor issues. Um, whereas the main question is, can she lead or can she not lead? He shows that in fact in the hadith literature itself, there was a precedent for a woman leading uh, men in prayer. Now the book has a bit of a provocative title, Misquoting Muhammad. What, what is Jonathan Brown trying to get at with that title? <laughs> well, the, the, the title actually is uh, a, a spin-off from uh, a, a famous book by Bart Ehrman entitled Misquoting Jesus. Um, so the similar title is used here. The approach is slightly different in that in uh, Bart Ehrman's book, uh, we, we are dealing more with uh, a very um, critical approach to the sayings of Jesus. Uh, here, Jonathan Brown is uh, in fact following a very traditional type of approach, a Muslim traditional approach towards uh, sifting. Uh, traditions. This is something that Muslim scholars have been doing throughout the generations. Uh, Brown uh, is cool in that methodology and he applies it uh, here as well. Can you give us a sense of what that methodology is all about? Well, uh, when, when somebody claimed that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said something, um, eventually scholars uh, began to demand that they name uh, their, their sources for that information. Um, in the earliest generation, it didn't, um, there was no need for that because whoever said the heard the prophet said something um, was there alive in the time of the prophet, peace be upon him. But if you go a hundred years later and the first generation died out and somebody is saying the prophet said X, well, uh, how did you know that the prophet said X? You must have heard it from somebody else. Well, who did you hear it from? And now we want to know whether that is a reliable person. Um, and I maybe mean, we'll go, we'll go check with the person. But now three or four generations later, you can't even check with the initial people who are said to have narrated this. So what you have emerging is a chain of narrators. One person saying, I heard from A, who heard from B, who heard from C, who heard from D, who heard from E, uh, who said that the prophet said such and such. Uh, so now the uh, classical Muslim scholars uh, drew up biographies of uh, these narrators, A, B, C, D, and E, and um, uh, tried to find out who they met, who they talked to, who were their students, who were their scholars, their teachers, to see if uh, a, there was a continuous link uh, from the Prophet, peace be upon him, all the way down through the generations until this uh, narrative comes to be written down. Uh, so that we can rely on the narrative by virtue of the known fact that these persons in the link are all reliable individuals and, and we can trust what they, what they said. 
And so by this method, do we have the, the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad preserved accurately for us? Well, well this was not uh, the, the only method. Uh, there was also a certain degree of subjectivity and uh, use of the rational faculty that scholars apply to the process. And that if something looked like a blatant lie, they wouldn't even bother dealing with the chain of narrators because it just looks like this is not something the Prophet, peace be upon him, would have said. So as a result of all of this process, uh, they have uh, differentiated between uh, the authentic and inauthentic uh, narratives. And uh, some books were compiled only with of, of those narratives which are thought to be authentic, such as Al-Bukhari Sahih or uh, Muslims uh, Sahih. Other books contain a mixture uh, of the two. Uh, mainly authoritative narratives, but also some sprinkling of other ones. And, and sometimes it's not uh, uh, clear that a narrative is either strong or, or um, unreliable. It's somewhere in between. And these narratives too have been compiled in large numbers in some of the classical texts. Now, we're, we're coming to a close here, but you mentioned that maybe there's some criticisms that you would like to, uh, to offer about the book as well. What, what, do, you, what do you have to say? What regard? I would have liked is for Brown to have given his own opinion uh, and his own evaluation clearly uh, in, in the book much more often. Uh, most often we just have to find from the nuances in the way he says things where his opinion lies because he's reporting the opinions of other scholars uh, and, and he's not telling us what he himself uh, thinks about the issue. Only in the appendix, and this is where I find it more refreshing, where in the appendix he does give us his own opinion about certain hadiths. For example, the hadith that mentions that the martyr will have 72 virgins in paradise. He says that this hadith is weak. Uh, a hadith that says that a father will not be uh, given the capital punishment if he kills his own child he finds that hadith to be weak. And there's a hadith which says that uh, the lowest grade of, of dealing with interest is uh, like having uh, a bout of uh, fornication with your mother. Uh, he finds that also to be unreliable. So I, I, I like th when the author tells us what precisely he thinks, so we don't have to second guess. Uh, because we go to a book, we want to know what this author uh, is telling us based on his expertise or her expertise, uh, and, and we need to find that information easily. Okay, thank you very much for that. You're welcome. <laughs>